Good, good evening. Uh, it's a joy to, to be able to join you uh, this, this evening and get to spend uh, some precious time together as we uh, reflect. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, very long bio. I should probably cut that down or at least start lying about some of my history. I don't know. Simplify it. Uh, the truth is... Um, it's a joy to be with you again this evening, and I'll have the opportunity to be with you uh, tomorrow uh, as well. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be uh, inviting you to read with me a text from uh, John's Gospel, uh, the section of John uh, where Jesus engages with a woman uh, ominously known as the Samaritan woman. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to share this evening uh, kind of a, in a, almost in a, a, a raw way um, some, some research and work that I've been uh, giving myself to over the course of the last few years. Uh, y- years ago uh, in the 16th century, uh, Martin Luther uh, was once asked by one of his really snarky students, um, what did God do on the eighth day of creation? And Luther was reported to have say, said uh, that on the eighth day, God was creating hell for people who asked really silly questions. <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways, I, I kind of love asking uh, what may th- seem like really silly questions. I wrote a book on, uh, on the topic of the Sabbath, and a lot of people wonder why this even mattered. Um, it may seem like a silly topic tonight. But my gut tells me uh, that this is probably gonna be a very personal conversation for many of you. Uh, For years, uh, I have been preaching in uh, some of the largest suburban churches in my movement in our country. I've had the opportunity to travel our nation and speak in uh, churches across our, our country. And it is almost a predictable experience, almost as trustworthy uh, as, uh, as scripture, that I will, at the end of speaking, have a mom or a father come up to me and hand me a phone number. And on that phone number will be not the name of the parent, but the name of their child, with the name of that child written on that piece of paper. And the parent will ask me to reach out to their child and talk to them about faith. They haven't been able to get across for years, they'll tell me. Will you meet with them? Will you talk with them? I remember when 9-11 took place, there were these phenomena, these experiences of um, people who had lost loved ones placing their phone numbers on walls with pictures of their uh, children, their spouses, their parents. And every time I receive one of those phone numbers from a parent hoping that I'll meet with their child to talk about faith, I remember 9-11. I remember the heart of a parent looking for their, their, ch- their child. The heart of a parent wondering where their kid has gone. I have a story about a young man named Phil who I met years ago. I had the opportunity to pastor Phil over the course of uh, a, a period of time in, in, in Portland when I lived uh, in the heart of the Hawthorne District and one of the most progressive cities in America. We had planted a church in the heart of the city. Portland's a very, by the way, very weird place to pastor. Um, uh, Portland has some very interesting uh, statistics. For example, Portland has more nonprofits per capita than any city in the world. So there are more people working in the nonprofit sector than anywhere else. There are also, simultaneously, uh, more strip clubs per capita than any city in the world, in Portland. Uh, It's a very odd phenomenon. It's a city in tension, and actually that says a great deal about the city of Portland. Uh, It is a place where people do justice during the day, uh, fight for what is good and true, but at night, I get to do what I want to do. So it's a very weird sense of justice. And it has become the place, as they say in Portlandia, the place uh, where the young go to retire. In my context as a pastor, it became the place where people moved from middle America and in many cases lost their faith. Time and time again, I had this experience as I did with a young man by the name of Phil. Uh, Phil moved to Portland. He had uh, graduated from uh, high school in a classic middle American high school uh, in one of the flyover states. I hate calling it that, but that's become what we know it by, unfortunately, in our context. And he had heard about 
uh, this software job that had opened up in Portland and he had a phone interview and had gotten a job. Uh, Phil moved to Portland and reached out to me by email and introduced himself. Uh, his su- the subject line in the email uh, said everything. I want to plug in at the church. And so we met for coffee and Phil told me a story. He had been raised in a classic conservative Christian household, had been raised with a love for Jesus, had been a key part of the youth group that he had been a part of, uh, served Sunday mornings uh, with the big church, with the, with the grown-ups, and upon graduation knew he wanted to go into software engineering. And so moved to Portland and immediately we met. Uh, Phil was on fire for faith when he moved to Portland. So excited to live on mission, to, uh, to live uh, in community, grow in his faith. Phil told me a story. He had had an experience when he was in high school, uh, an experience with the Holy Spirit on a Thursday evening, which as Pentecostals, Thursday evening is always Holy Spirit night. He had had an experience with the Holy Spirit at a camp. Uh, he'd had, in fact, seen a friend get healed of a broken leg at a camp. It was a profound experience for him. He had had a pornography addiction that God had healed. A powerful testimony. And he was so excited to come and live in Portland and live his faith out. We hugged, I told him, a sto- I told him how he can plug in at the church. We talked about ways that he could worship. And he left. And I saw him go off as I did so many young men with the hope that he would find a new sense of faith in Portland. One year later, I heard from Phil again. He wanted to meet a second time. But this time, Phil had a different tune to sing. Over the course of one year, Phil had undergone an entire deconstruction experience. And he no longer identified as a Christian and grieved the transitions that he had gone through. I grieved his transition. Certainly, I I expressed him the sadness I had, but over the course of one year uh, of living in Portland, he had deconstructed his entire faith. That is, of course, not just one story. It's hundreds of stories. I've lived in the city of Portland for 10 years. I've lived in Oregon my entire life, and I have seen young person after young person come to Oregon with great hopes of following Jesus, and within years or a year, no longer identify as Christians or identify as Christians that would not in any way, shape, or form represent the historic Christian tradition. So what do we do? This evening, I want to explore the story of the Samaritan woman because I ultimately believe that unless we have the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no hope. The Holy Spirit is the key, the promise, and the hope of the world. Jesus told his disciples that he would leave, he would go to the Father. And with that departure came the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, unless I leave, the Spirit cannot come. Tonight, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. It looks as though our world is coming apart, doesn't it? Every day, it seems like everything's about to end. I love that Jesus is just sitting there. He's at peace. A world falling apart, a world of fills walking away from their faith does not cause Jesus to pace in heaven. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit and we have tremendous hope. I remember reading about Leslie Newbegin who wrestled with this very question when he was uh, a young man, uh, w- went to serve overseas, uh, left his Christian uh, England to go serve uh, for I think 30 or 40 years, 25, 30, I mean, a significant portion of time. And he talks about leaving uh, Britain as a Christian nation, but returning uh, to Britain as a pagan society. In his book, Unfinished Agenda, he talks about this. He says, I left in England as a Christian nation, but I've come back and it's a pagan nation. He says, England has become a pagan society and the development of a truly missionary encounter with this very tough form of paganism is the greatest intellectual and practical task facing the church. His point was that the kind of missionary work that he had to do before he left England was very different than the work he had to do afterwards. And the work of ministering to people who used to believe is very different than ministering to people who have yet to believe. And tonight, I want to explore how do we actually minister to those who used to believe. And I suspect that Jesus is gonna have something awesome to say to us about that. Before we continue, I need to fix my microphone. (laughs) 
I think that works. Are we good? Perfect. If we could, let's read John 4. Uh, I'm gonna read this, this encounter, of course, with Jesus and this woman, uh, the Samaritan woman. And, and, and we're gonna take some time and kind of wrestle with what Jesus does here. And I, I need to assume, by the way, that uh, I'm, I believe in a Trinitarian theology. So what we're gonna see Jesus do here is what I'm gonna argue the Holy Spirit is doing in our world today. Uh, what Jesus did with this uh, particular woman, his encounter with her is going to become the way that we can understand doing ministry today. But, oh, I should also say, sorry, one more thing. Uh, it, it was interesting to me in preparing for this talk, this is the first time I've given this talk, so I'm up here sort of trembling and asking the Holy Spirit to lead me as we move forward. Um, the number of emails that I received in advance of parents who are sitting in this room who this is a very real conversation with. This is not a theoretical or a theoretical thing. This is a real issue that many of us are facing who have children who we have absolutely no idea how to serve and love in the context of their deconstruction of faith. So I'd like to pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we begin our time together today, I am cognizant that this conversation is anything but theoretical. This is real. This is thanksgiving. This is the last few years of watching our children and our friends and people that we know experience this deconstruction experience. As we engage Jesus with the story that you engage with this woman, this Samaritan woman, would we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit to teach us and lead us and move us forward to be missionaries in this new, really weird Western world that we live in? Teach us how to serve faithfully, to be true to the good news of Jesus, the scriptures, and true to the voice of the Holy Spirit. God, we pray for those who we know who have wandered away from the faith, And over them, we pray that they would come back to the Father's home and they would wander there through whatever experience, God, you put in their path, that you would bring them back and maybe along the way, God, that you'd use us to do that. In the name of Jesus, amen. John 4, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more uh, to Galilee. Uh, By the way, before continuing, uh, what Jesus just did there of hearing that they're wondering why uh, he's baptizing more, you get the sense of religious jealousy. The Pharisees and Sadducees are feeling a bit jealous that Jesus is doing more ministry than they they are. Um, And as Jesus often does, when there's pressure uh, to be forced in a certain way to be or do, Jesus does what we all should do, he flees. He runs away. Uh, If we were reading uh, uh, Mark's gospel, uh, those that have studied Mark would call that the messianic secret, that Jesus is constantly telling people uh, to not spread the news uh, that he is the Messiah, that he is the king. And in this particular context, we see that in John's gospel, he does this quite often. Uh, there's, there's at one point, uh, the text says that they, they wanted to force him to be king. But what does Jesus do when he's put into a corner? Well, he flies away. We can't corner Jesus. And so Jesus leaves and he goes back to Galilee. Verse four. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot ground, plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman drew water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw from and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave you this well and drank from it himself? As did he also the sons and his flock and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty 
and have to keep coming here to draw water. So he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have five husbands and the man you now have isn't your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of fathers the worshipers seek, the, the worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of God. Would you say amen with me this evening? Thanks be to God. Uh, the, the story, by the way, continues. This woman is eventually gonna go into her homeland. She's gonna go into Samaria, her, 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 the town that she's from, and she's going to tell everybody about Jesus. Uh, it is remarkable to me that in John's gospel, the, the first evangelist is a woman. Uh, it is a non-Jewish woman. The, the first person to reveal the nature of Jesus to a whole people group uh, is a Samaritan woman. There's, by the way, all sorts of firsts that the women get in the Bible. The first person to name God uh, is, you may remember Hagar when she goes into the wilderness and she says, you are the God who sees. That's the first time in the Bible that God is given a, sort of a nickname. Isn't it interesting it's by a non-Jew? Isn't it interesting that when Jesus comes out of the grave, it is the men who are in a room terrified and the women who go and see that the tomb is empty. The first Easter sermon was preached by the ladies. And we ask if women can preach. We wouldn't know about Easter if it wasn't for the ladies. This woman, in the span of just a few moments, becomes the first missionary in the church or at least in John's gospel. But before that's gonna happen, we're gonna see that Jesus is going to entirely deconstruct her understanding of who God is. I wanna begin with point one. When we look at the Holy Spirit and the life of Jesus, we find that the Spirit from time to time, in order for the Spirit to birth true faith, has to deconstruct our false faith. The Spirit is the ultimate deconstructor of false faith. We know a few things about the way Jews and Samaritans interacted with each other in the, in the ancient world. We know, for example, that Jews and Samaritans did not interact with each other in the ancient world. They hated each other. Um, New Testament scholars have pointed out that it was actually unlawful for a Jew to even say the word Samaria or Samaritan in the ancient world. Even the word Samaritan would be considered an act of impurity. Thirdly, Jews, Jews did not go into Samaria. You would never walk into Samaria. It was a, a part of town that if you went in the wrong time of day or, or you decided to go at all as a Jew, you, it puts you uh, at great trouble. It was potentially not only for purposes of impurity but for your own safety. So Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. There's very, it's very clear that Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. It is, by the way, interesting that in the Pentecost story, when the Spirit falls on the church, the text, Luke tells us, that standing next to each other are Cretans and Arabs as they watch the Spirit descend. And they ask, is this God speaking all of these wonders in our native tongue? It is interesting that Luke puts Cretans and Arabs next to each other. In the ancient world, Cretans and Arabs absolutely hated each other. They wanted to kill each other. 
And when Luke says the Spirit comes, it is not a mistake that he puts Cretans and Arabs right next to each other in that text. There are different groups of people that have to interact with one another. I love that John describes heaven and says when he sees heaven, he sees every tribe and tongue worshiping at the throne of God. How can he look and see every tribe? Well, because it wasn't full of just white people. There were Africans, there were Asians, there were Haitians, there were, you can name it. You could see every tribe and every tongue represented in heaven. What's powerful to me when you look at heaven is that heaven does not annihilate God's created diversity of races. They all worship together as God has made them. Heaven will be very painful for racists. We will be forced to worship God by the power of the Spirit. All sorts of people we probably never wanted to be around down here. And so Jesus comes to this woman who naturally, a Jew, would hate a Samaritan. A Samaritan would hate a Jew. There would have been mutual hatred built up over years. I often tell my students, in fact, I lectured on this just last week. You read this story, and to be honest with you, this is not a model for evangelism. Jesus, within just a few lines, gets into a conversation with a stranger about her sex life. I wouldn't recommend that. If you meet a new person, you don't have any relationship, it's not wise within just a few verses to start asking them how many people they've been with. But Jesus is the master evangelist. And Jesus knows things that we don't know. And immediately Jesus, we see, begins to point out some things in her own belief structure that were off. In Raymond Brown's commentary on this section, he points out, isn't it interesting, that Jesus never gives up truth for the purpose of love, meaning Jesus in this interaction is quite pointed with this woman. He even says to her, you worship what you don't know. You don't even know what you worship. I guess this kind of pops any notion of a nice guy that we have in Jesus. He is not Mr. Rogers. He does not run an interfaith circle with everyone and say everything's just fine. Jesus gets into it. And he points out, you don't know what you worship. Theologians are quick to point out that this woman was a worshiper. The issue was not worship. The issue was her object of worship. She worshiped. It was just that she didn't worship the true God, or at least didn't worship the way Jesus was inviting her to. One could say she was religious, but not yet spiritual. So many young people I know claim to be spiritual but not religious. She's the opposite. She has religion, but she does not have the spirit. Jesus even gets a little Jewish here and says salvation comes from the Jews. Her theology has been off. She's been worshiping wrongly. What I love about Jesus here is he is unwilling to give up the difficulty of truth for the purpose of loving. Jesus is shattering her theology. When I, when I look at all the fills that I work with, uh, the, this, this, this kind of group of, of people who, uh, who have similar stories, raised in the church, raised in a, uh, the tradition of loving Jesus, raised in uh, wonderful families, and then somewhere around college, they have this similar experience. Around college, they begin to ask really big questions about their faith. They begin to ask pointed questions about uh, the nature of, of the Bible and, 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 the, and, 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 and what is a Christian's role in the world. And, and, then, and then at some point down the road, they begin to make decisions about the kind of person that they're going to be. Every single person is on what we could call a theological trajectory or a journey. 
Uh, Walter Brueggemann in his fabulous book on the, on the Psalms, he says that when you look at all the Psalms, right? There's, we got a lot of them, but when you look at the Psalms, he says there's three, different kind, there's three different kinds of Psalms. You have Psalms of orientation. These are Psalms that orient us to God. They, they, they point us to God. They give us direction about who God is. We have Psalms of disorientation, which are Psalms where God disorients our understanding of who he is. He makes things challenging and difficult. He walks us through the desert, and then he says there are Psalms of reorientation. That there's orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And in the Christian tradition, I would say that we have three major parts of the journey, construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction. Construction are those years where we're constructing our beliefs, where we're beginning to understand what it is that we believe. Uh, we're given a faith in the Bible, in Jesus, in the church. Deconstruction are those years where we, we wrestle with those ideas. We pull them apart. We kick the tires of our faith. And then there's this third part called reconstruction, where we begin to put it all back together again. What I have observed is time and time and time again, young people who come through construction and they make it to deconstruction, but for some odd reason, what should be deconstruction, a healthy time of questioning and, and rethinking through the faith for your own becomes not deconstruction, but faith destruction. It's a fundamental difference. Deconstruction is, is, can be healthy and good, challenging and questioning and pushing in, but for some odd reason, so many young people that I'm seeing are not deconstructing their faith for the purpose of reconstruction. They are simply destroying their faith and walking away. I look at my own story. Uh, when I met Jesus at 16 years old, uh, for, for four years I, I was, met Jesus and in in then I started going to a Baptist church. Man, they force fed the Bible to me. I had to learn scripture, get it tattooed all over my body, memorize it in the original text. I had to know the Bible, which was great. I love that. But somewhere around seminary, when I was 24, 25, I started to figure out that it was really cool to question the faith. I don't know where it was or why it happened. Certainly my seminary professors taught me that it's important to question. The Bible can handle our questions. We should wrestle through the things. I, I think that that's a really important thing to do. But that deconstruction period, which lasted for me about two years, was also very scary. Asking questions about the Bible. What does the Bible say? What does the Christian tradition say? It was by God's grace that I had a pastor, a spiritual director, who brought me through to reconstruction, but I will say that that period of deconstruction was really scary. And what I have to say, friends, about this text, about Jesus in particular, is that as, I, as far as I can find, <laughs> Jesus is actually the one that often deconstructs people's faith. He helps them shatter their false notions of God so that they can experience God purely. It's the story of Isaiah, isn't it? Isaiah walks into the temple. He believed in God, but he'd never experienced God. And he walks into the temple and he sees God and he cries out oh, the, the voice, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. This image of God, his, his theology was shattered, but his experience of God became real. C.S. Lewis, I'm gonna take this mic off. It's, I'm gonna deconstruct this mic, if that's all right. And I'm gonna just use this. C.S. Lewis actually talks about this very idea. He says that, that, that one of the marks of, of somebody having a true experience of God is that from time to time, God destroys their theology so they can experience God. In his book, A Grief Observed, he's talking about his wife, Joy, who had passed away, and he's lamenting how he loved his memory of her more than he loved her. And he says, the, in, in his book, A Grief Observed, he says, I want my Joy wife, not something that is like her, just like I need Christ, not something that resembles him. A really good photograph might become in the end a snare, a horror, an obstacle. Images of the holy easily become holy images, sacrosanct. My, I, but my idea of God is not a divine idea. Sometimes it has to be shattered. And you know who shatters it? God. 
God is the great iconoclast. He is the one who shatters my theology. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? The incarnation is the supreme example. It leaves all previous ideas of the Messiah in ruins. Friends, Lewis is making the same point I think John is making. And the point is this, from time to time, deconstruction is a really healthy part of loving God. You know who deconstructed? Jesus deconstructed. He said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. He was saying, you, the, all those religious concepts that you've had, I'm saying to you, there's a new way of life. There's a new way of truth. Martin Luther deconstructed when he nailed those 95 theses on the wall in Wittenberg. He was saying, I believe in the gospel and religion has gotten in the way. He was deconstructing something. Friends, deconstruction is not always bad, but sometimes deconstruction is absolutely horrible. A.W. Tozer talks about disillusionment and he says, actually, the Christian should be the most disillusioned person ever. He says, can you imagine, to be, a, he says, there's nothing worse than a Christian who is illusioned, who believes in illusion. He says the most important thing is we need Christians who see God for who God is, not, what am I trying to say? It is possible to worship theology and forget about God. This woman worshiped just the wrong thing. You know, one, one of the marks of, this is, this is one of the, the themes that I think about a lot. One, one of the marks of the Western culture, we, we are just drunk on freedom. We are drunk on freedom. Everything is about freedom. But here's the weird thing. I don't think we actually believe in freedom. I think we believe in a really sick version of freedom. Uh, David Brooks, who writes for the New York Times, he, 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 he kind of writes about this a lot. And he did a sample of all of the graduating classes from the last few years. And he said, it's really interesting when you listen to graduating speakers, which they're sometimes really sappy, sometimes great, but sometimes absolutely horrible. He said, when you look at them all, he says, you find one thing, that all of the graduation speakers that we have going through our campuses right now are all about go find yourself. He says this, they are sent off into this world with this theology ringing in your ears, that if you sample some of the commencement addresses being broadcast on C-SPAN these days, you see that graduates are told, follow your passions, chart your own course, march to the beat of your own drummer, follow your dreams and find yourself. This is the litany of expressive individualism. We are taught from a childhood age to become ourselves. We are obsessed with freedom. And as a result of being obsessed with freedom, I wonder if at some point along the way we thought we had permission in our freedom to recreate God in our own image. I had a student ask me, or say in class bluntly, he said, I can't believe in the Bible because the slave owners used it to, to argue for slavery. And I said, you're absolutely right. The slave owners used the Bible to back up their ideology. And I said, but don't forget this. The Bible was also the book of the slaves. And it gave hope to people in their worst moments. I said to this young man, I said, we don't need to deconstruct the Bible. The Bible is the hope of the slave. We need to deconstruct our really bad ideas about the Bible because the Bible is true. Friends, deconstruction can be utterly freeing to recognize the ways that we have gotten God wrong. And it is the Spirit of God who leads us to truth. Have you noticed it is almost impossible, it is impossible to talk to people about politics anymore. You can't bring anything up anymore without people killing, just, it's horrible. And we keep saying that the church is not political and we're absolutely lying to ourselves. The church of Jesus Christ is entirely political. You cannot say Jesus is Lord and say we're not political. 
to say Jesus Christ is Lord is to say that every other tyrant, king, power, no matter who it is, bows at the feet of Jesus. We are a political organization. We're not a partisan organization. We need the kingdom. The Spirit of God is always leading us to the kingdom, not parts of the kingdom. That's what I hate about our partisan environment. I can't find a party that will simultaneously tell me that refugees matter and the unborn matter. I have to pick. I hate that. The kingdom of God does not fit in our partisan structure. But we are better at doing partisan Christianity than political Christianity. Jesus Christ is Lord and the Spirit of God is creating a people who know how to proclaim Jesus in this very broken environment. I think sometimes, friends, the Spirit wants to shatter our really sick ideologies and our really sick notions of truth so that we can have truth. Jesus deconstructs this woman's theology so she can experience God. We see this too. <laughs> that the Spirit of God is a seeker. And the Spirit of God seeks. This, this image actually comes up a number of times in the New Testament. Did you notice Jesus said here, uh, yeah, a time is coming, it has now come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of worshiper the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That the Father seeks, right? That the Father is trying to find a, a certain kind of worshiper. The Father seeks. The Father goes. The Father uh, is the missionary in the Bible. Any of us that would say that the church has a mission do, don't understand that God is the missionary in the Bible. We're just following God. It's interesting, the text says Jesus had to go through Samaria. That's not, I don't know how that's possible. Jesus was right here and where he was going was here and this was Samaria. He would have normally gone all the way around. He decides to go through it. He didn't have to. He went through the dangerous territory. He went to Samaria when he didn't have to. Why? Because Jesus is following the Father. He is seeking people. And the Spirit is seeking people. I love, by the way, in this story, I love Jesus does his best stuff when the disciples are gone. <laughs> the disciples are off getting lunch, classic move. They're worried about physical food and here is Jesus doing the real missionary work. I love at the very end of Jonah chapter one. It is not until Jonah is thrown off the boat that the sailors on the boat get saved. Sometimes we have to get out of the way. The point is that even when the disciples are absent, Jesus Christ is at work. Even when no one is in the room, God is at work. When you read the book of Daniel, when it seems like the remnant is completely gone and there's no hope anymore, Nebuchadnezzar is in a room and God is still there writing on a wall with his finger. The point is God will never leave us without a witness. The Father seeks, Jesus speaks, seeks, the Spirit seeks. They are seeking us. The Spirit is constantly pushing in to our lives. I had to tell you, it, uh, it's really hard to pastor people and love people who are deconstructing their faith, and here's why. They just ask too many questions. They drive you mad. Uh, the Germans, this is a lexical gap, which means we don't have it in English, but the Germans have a word, uh, pamachuka, which is a person who asks too many questions. We don't have that in English. It's really hard to develop a relationship with a young person or a person who's deconstructing their faith, who's, who's wandered away from the faith, because friends, they ask questions that none of us wanna think about. They push the buttons, they ask the hard questions. 
But I wanna remind us in those moments where we have an opportunity to share life with somebody who's deconstructing their faith or walking away, that your and my presence in their life is a signpost of the Spirit seeking them. Just being with them. I often like to remind people who are questioning their faith. Remember, it's important to question. It's not, a, it's not always a bad thing. When Martin Luther wrote those 95 theses and put them on the wall, I like to remind people most of them are questions. The church was reformed through good questions. The Spirit of God will always push us into places of discomfort and to help us begin to engage people in their worlds. I would imagine right now that you're thinking of somebody, maybe you know somebody, and boy would it be easy to just go around them. I suspect that line about Jesus, he had to go there, friends, you have to go there. By the way, I absolutely love the Amish, aside from their furniture. Um, the Amish have a practice. This is brilliant. Uh, maybe you've heard of this. The Amish have a practice called rumspringa. Have you ever heard of rumspringa? Which is when an Amish child turns 18 years old, they are released into the world to do anything they want to do. They go party basically for a year. I have a friend who wrote a whole book on rumspringa, and the stats are astounding. You know what percentage of young people come back after their year of rumspringa, which means running away? You know what percentage come back? 98.5%. I actually wonder if part of our assignment in leading young people is to give them space to differentiate and become the people God has called them to be. I know a lot of young people who immediately after walking away from the faith, all of a sudden are doing a ton of justice work. I, had, I interviewed one young man who uh, had this story. He had walked away from his faith and now he serves in a nonprofit in Portland and he's all about doing justice. And I said, why, do you, why are you so into justice? And he said, I'm so into justice because my parents didn't do any of it and I want them to see I'm doing it differently than they did. We sometimes do justice as a middle finger we don't always do it out of love. Sometimes we do it because we're reacting. But I wonder if so many young people have never been given a chance to have questions and to be loved in the middle of those questions. Could the Spirit empower you to be presence to somebody who is asking really big questions? I say this to any parent who has a kid who's walked away from the faith or deconstructing when they come home for Thanksgiving. The greatest gift you can give your kid is just let them be at the table. Let them sit. Let them ask their questions. My pastor actually got saved because he was on a truck. He was a hippie during the Jesus movement and he was on a truck and he wasn't a Christian but the truck driver uh, told him he was a Christian and my, my friend Steve said, when, when was it that you became a Christian and why? And he told him how he became a Christian and my friend Steve asked him, why do you believe? And the truck driver said, I don't know. And my friend said, finally I've met an honest Christian. I wonder if actually our questions make room for people to be invited. So Jesus, not only as the Spirit and Jesus, both this, they, they invite us to, to go into difficult places, they also invite us thirdly to truth. And Jesus makes it crystal clear, he says the Spirit is about truth, that the Father is about spirit and truth, spirit and truth, spirit and truth. You can't separate those. That the spirit is a truth teller and truth leads us to the spirit. It's interesting to me, by the way, that the first words out of Jesus' mouth in this story are a question. He says, can I have something to drink? I find it odd that the guy who invented water is here asking for somebody for a glass of water. The creator of the universe is saying, hey, can I have a cup of water? The first words out of the father's mouth in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sin is a question. Where are you? God is always asking questions and his goal is truth. Truth is not very popular in our time. 
We've replaced truth with my truth. Uh, we have uh, replaced truth with opinion. I had one of the scariest moments in a class this last week. I asked my students in an undergraduate class on the Bible, I asked if it's okay to judge anymore. And my students said, no, you can't judge. Judgment is wrong. And I said, would it be okay to judge what the Third Reich did? And they all looked at each other to ask, are we allowed to judge? We're so terrified to make any judgments about right and wrong. We don't wanna hurt, and I understand that. And we spend a lot of our time focusing on sins out there. But friends, truth is not to be held at a peripheral level. It is to be invited in, to be reshaped around. Jesus says that wherever the Spirit is, there is truth. Where the Spirit is speaking, the Spirit speaks truth. The Spirit and truth always go together. In this study about the nuns, uh, the, the truth is, I actually don't encounter a whole lot of nuns, people that don't, nuns, in the N-O-N-E-S part, sense. I don't encounter a lot of people that don't believe. I more and more am encountering what I call sums, people who have picked and chosen which aspects of truth and reality they want to believe. When a young person says to me, I could never believe in a God who, and then fill in the blank, created this hell or whatever, the difficult judgments of scripture. Whenever, when I hear a young person say, I could never believe in a God who, I have to ask, well, at what point did we think we got to recreate reality? Truth is truth, and Jesus Christ is truth. And the Spirit will always point us towards Jesus. In fact, in the early church, uh, they wrestled with this very concept. Thomas Aquinas had a very beautiful concept. He said, any statement of truth is from the Holy Spirit, no matter who utters it. Truth is God's truth. Friends, I wonder if the Spirit of God is inviting us to lay aside false notions of truth. You know, I love this story. I love this story of reconstruction because it's a beautiful, to go from construction to deconstruction, to pull apart to this process of actually coming back to reconstruction is really beautiful. One of the the folks that has embodied this is a guy named uh, Thomas Oden, who's a theologian, brilliant theologian, uh, who um, for many respects in his earliest years was a, uh, kind of deconstructed his faith. His earliest uh, theological tradition, tradition, he was very sort of um, critical of the Christian tradition. And then he read the apostolic fathers, the early church fathers, the mothers and fathers in the early church who died for the faith. And he was so compelled in his spirit that these people had died for their faith that just to do away with what they thought was unfair and he had a reconversion to Jesus. And Thomas Oden spent the rest of his life doing what he could to reconstruct this faith that he had torn apart. At the end of his life, he said that before his reconstruction period, he would, uh, when he was in in his 20s, he would only read somebody as long as they were under 40. And then after his reconstruction period, he said he would only read people as long as they were older than 400. He loved the ancients. There was something about coming back to to the spirit of truth, to the apostolic teaching, to Jesus through the spirit that caused him to begin to deconstruct his own deconstruction. That as big of the questions that we might have about faith, as, as much as we may wrestle with the truth, as much as we may, friends, the spirit I think is inviting us to actually begin to now question our questions, to doubt our doubts to deconstruct our deconstruction and to begin to come back to the truth. Jesus Christ is truth, he says, doesn't he? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He himself was truth. I've often reflected on John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin. When John the Baptist worshiped Jesus, let's just name it, Jesus, his cousin was worshiping him. I don't know if you have a cousin that you worship. I certainly don't have any cousins that I worship. 
In our world, our world says that truth is relative. The Bible says something quite different. Truth is not relative, truth is a relative. It is a person. And that truth is not a set of propositions or concepts, but truth is a person. And that truth became a person in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, when people looked at God, they died. Whenever they saw his face, they died. And so they never wanted to see God's face because they would die. But in the New Testament, when God comes, when truth comes, they look God in the face and God chooses to die. Truth has come. He walked, he breathed, he lived a life, he was crucified. Whenever truth comes to this world, we end up crucifying it. And the invitation of the Spirit is eternally to come back to Jesus Christ. I suspect that we need to spend less time trying to make it about getting people to necessarily come back to church first, as though that, though that will fix the problem. Sometimes people need to spend time away from the church, and that breaks my heart. Church is hard, it breaks my heart going. But we spend all of our time trying to get people to go to church. But the truth is, friends, church doesn't save anybody. I remember Carl Bart was once asked, by one of his snarky students. It seems like all the students are snarky. He was once asked by one of his students, is Christianity the only religion that saves anybody in Karl Barth, in only a Karl Barth way, said, no, Christianity has never saved anybody. It is only the gospel and truth of Jesus Christ that can save us all. Sometimes it's important to deconstruct our notions of religion and church because we need to feel out and experience all of these these differing feelings. I think that that's an important part. I hope we don't stay there. Deconstruction is is a place to visit, but I would never wanna live there. But the goal that we all need to have is not that people will come to my position on some partisan issue or my view of the church or come to this vision of sexuality or this, that, but our, that we would press people the way the Spirit of God does towards the person who is truth, Jesus Christ. That that is our goal. The story of Phil ends beautifully, by the way. After struggling with his faith for years, not identifying with his Christian, Phil made his way back into my office. And Phil came back exhausted from his years of listening to every podcast he could get his hands on. He'd spent the two, three years just listening to every podcast he could get his hands on. He was exhausted with the questions and he came back into my office and he said, I wanna go back to the God I knew a long time ago. And I said, Phil, that is returning to your first love, isn't it? I know Phil to this day, and his faith has a kind of patina, and every grandma in the room knows what that is. Patina is that brown stuff that gets on uh, your baking sheets after you've baked it for 50 years. Patina is the marks of maturity. It's the mark of having gone through the fire. Phil's faith has a different patina on it that it never had because he walked through this difficult time and he embodies what the Spirit of God is doing for every young person by inviting them back to the Father's house. As Jesus invited this Samaritan woman to come to truth, Jesus invites us to do the same. And that every wayward son and daughter that we know, every person who has walked away from their faith is a potential point of tremendous grace and mercy. We just need to make room in the home. You know, at the end of the day, the true story of the parable of the prodigal son, we read that story and we go, the whole story is about a guy who wanders away and finally comes back. But we can't forget that there's another part of that story and that is it is possible to be the older brother, never have left home and still be very lost. We should not assume that just because we've stayed, we're not lost. We all must come face to face through the power of the Spirit with Jesus Christ. 
and come back with our confession and hear the words of the Father. Let's throw a party. My son is back. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as tonight we've spent some time wrestling with how the Spirit is pushing us into uncomfortable places, how the Spirit invites us to do what Jesus did in some powerful way in our world, simple but powerful way, we would ask that by the Spirit we would be able to walk into those places with grace and mercy, not lashing back with anger or harshness, but we would see missionary work, a valid missionary work to loving people who used to believe. That God, we would learn to love those who have walked away and do so faithfully. Push us, God, into the areas of the Samaritans in our life. Because when the Spirit comes, we are sent to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We are sent there. We are sent. And that the wayward son and the wayward daughter matter to God. God, you are the Father who seeks. Help us to pursue your mission in this world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.